Welcome to today's SNEB webinar sponsored by the Dairy Council of California, who is an organizational member of SNEB and has been an organizational for many years. Um, their webinars are so well received that we're, we're excited to have um, this presentation for you today. My name is Rachel Dager. I'm the executive director of SNEB and glad you're joining us. Um, just a little housekeeping to get us started. If you look in the GoToWebinar panel, there's two handouts um, that you can download. So those are slides from uh, our two presenters today. So you can download those and follow along with your notes. Uh, we'll take questions at the end of the presentation. So please type those in the question block so we can moderate uh, those to the presenter today. When I close out the webinar today, there'll be a short survey, and we appreciate your feedback on this session, as well as ideas for future sessions. And then when I, um, oh, and we are recording today's session, so please watch for an email um, that'll come out on Wednesday of this week with a link to the recording, um, the slides. We have a few additional resource pages from uh, Dairy Council in that email, and then the CEU certificate that you're earning with your attendance today. So I'll introduce our moderator. Kristen Sheldon is a registered dietitian nutritionist and project manager of nutrition sciences at Dairy Council of California. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone again to our webinar. Um, and I'd like to begin by hoping that you, your family, and your community are doing the best that can be expected during this challenging time. Um, again, my name is Crystal Sheldon. I'm with Dairy Council of California, and we are a nutrition education organization that for over a century has empowered stakeholders, including educators, health professionals, and community leaders to elevate the health of children and families through the pursuit of lifelong healthy eating habits. Thank you for taking your time to join us in this important discussion today. We all share the value that the first five years of a child's life are especially critical in establish establishing the foundation for lifelong health. Today, we have the opportunity to hear from some amazing experts who will provide important aspects for consideration in supporting early childhood nutrition education and an opportunity to learn from their unique professional experiences. By the end of this webinar, we hope that you have been provided with some thought-provoking information on in addressing the unique nutritional needs of children through these early and critical life stages. By coming together like we're doing today as nutrition educators, we can find opportunities for collaborative action across disciplines and sectors that will lead to a future in which all children are supported to grow healthfully and reach their full potential for growth, development, and learning. And now I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker, Dr. Nina Shapiro. Dr. Shapiro has been a pioneer in medicine for more than two decades as a director of pediatric otolaryngology at the Mattel Children's Hospital and as a professor at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. She is the author of two health books and the editor of two academic books. Her health book, Hype, A Doctor's Guide to Medical Myths, Exaggerated Claims, and Bad Advice, How to Tell What's Real and What's Not as a Publisher's Weekly, was a Publisher's Weekly Best Books of 2018. She has dedicated much of her work to setting the record straight when it comes to what's best for the health of oneself and one's family. She has become a veteran of media work, fielding inquiries, and being featured in such high profile outlets as Time Magazine, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, NBC News, NPR, and CNN. Welcome, Dr. Nina Shapiro. Thank you, Crystal, and thanks so much for uh, having me today. And again, I want to thank uh, everybody for being here and hope that everybody is feeling well and safe, hopefully at home. If not at home, then in a safe environment. So today I'm going to be talking about nutrition education in the zero to five childcare environment, uh, which includes the, ho the home and prioritizing children's needs uh, in order to support their optimal growth. So ages zero to five are critical, as we all know, and it's not just for physical growth. It's also for brain development, emotional growth, 
lifelong habits that are established. There's time at home, but there's also time out of the home. And this could begin as early as age six weeks uh, for, some, for some infants. Um, parental influence is obviously key for the majority of childhood, but peer influence becomes critical as early as uh, age two years when children are, are spending more time with other children. So the importance of the childhood diet very early on is for physical growth, but also for cognitive growth. We, we can't forget that the brain is growing as, as is the rest of the body. And the importance of brain growth is, is definitely linked to uh, diet uh, as soon as, as a child is born. And obviously even before that is before they're born. Um, the importance of the growth will, it, benefit them not only during their childhood and infancy, but also later in life into adulthood and um, old, older age. And some of the problems that we are seeing uh, more and more over this, the last decades have been significant rise in obesity. And then all of the things that often go with obesity, such as hypertension, just high blood pressure, heart disease, type two diabetes has skyrocketed over the last decade or two, dental caries, even um, gum disease in children before they have teeth and cognitive delays. And all of this is related to a poor diet. So when we think of diet, we have to remember that beverages are part of the diet and, and certainly early on, beverages are the only part of the diet. And it's critical that we, can, we include beverages when we're talk about, talking about dietary concerns for children. So beverages are food. And, and in the medical and surgical world, when we think about um, solids, you know, beverages are oftentimes considered solids depending on what they are. Um, they're a significant source of calories, and I want to make sure that that uh, it's really important, especially for education, that people don't get too caught up with calorie counts and calorie numbers, because you know I like to think of it as good calories and bad calories. And um, so, you know, just because you're having a lot of calories, that's not necessarily a negative at all. Um, beverages are a significant source of nutrition. And of course, they're the primary source of hydration, but not the only source of hydration. And we'll talk a little bit about water um, in a few minutes. Um, so there are good calories. I know that's sort of controversial way of thinking about things, but I think you know we really have to think about when we're, we're considering food and beverages, you know, getting a, a good bang for your buck, and that if it's calories but good quality nutrition, um, that's much more important than having, say, fewer calories but with poor nutrition. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of hydration, but also how hydration can be exaggerated a little bit, and a lot of that has to do with marketing. And then a passion of mine that I'll, that I'll mention is labeling, because labeling, I think, is extremely deceptive, and we really do uh, need a lot more education in understanding how to read a label uh, of a product in both the front and the back. So zero to six months, pretty simple as far as intake uh, for, for kids, for babies. So beverages, it's breast milk or formula. It's simple as that. Um, and, you know, I'll talk about this. There's no best. It's, it's breast or a formula, either one. Um, solids begin, um, it used to be the American Academy of Pediatrics. Up until uh, the last few years, we're recommending that uh, infants start solids at six months. It's now cut back to four months. It is still a, a, an extremely small component of an infant's diet. So it's not really for nutrition or um, intake and calories per se, as much as just learning how to eat solid food. So whether it's four months or six months, it really doesn't matter long-term as far as nutrition. And beverages are the first, second, and third way that, that infants um, do obtain nutrition until age six months. Um, so when we get a little bit older, six to 12 months, uh, changes a little bit, gets a little more interesting. So um, beverages for six months, uh, water is then introduced. It's a little bit of water per day. So a half a cup to a cup of water per day is all that it, that an infant needs and, and not even necessarily that they have to have that because again, they're getting their liquid from other sources. Uh, breast milk can continue and, and oftentimes does until six months at least or 12 months. Um, and then infant formula continues as well until 12 months. 
when they get a little bit older in the one to two year uh, age range, it gets a little more interesting again. Um, there's obviously more food uh, variety that kids can have and, and also more beverage variety. So this is when um, kids are starting to walk and interact with other children. Um, so they may be having a little bit more water per day, um, anywhere from one to four cups. And again, this is a huge range, especially when you're thinking about a small child and there is no magic number for this. And then uh, that's when we start to introduce cow's milk into a child's diet. And this is recommend that it's full fat or whole fat, however it likes to be termed, um, whole milk, uh, two to three cups per day. And then we start to introduce juices. And this is really an option. It's not a necessity, certainly. Um, you have to be careful when you're talking about juice because most juices are labeled as juice, even if it is a quote unquote juice drink which is not necessarily juice itself. It could have a little bit, as little as 10% fruit in it. So you wanna make sure that it's 100% fruit and no more than a half a cup per day. And this does not increase as a child gets older. So really limited amount of juice. So this is really considered to be a maximum of a half a cup per day of juice. As they get older, they get a little more interactive and the food gets a little more interesting. The beverages get a little more varied and um, they are with their peers. So if your peer is gonna be having ice cream, you will be having ice cream as well. It's really, you know, I know that young parents oftentimes, or parents with young children, really have the idea that they will have uh, access and control of their child's diet forever. Um, and this goes away uh, quicker than, than most of us realize. Uh, what are the beverages that, that two to five year olds can have? It's really almost the same as one to two year olds. So water, they can certainly have, there's no, there's again, it's a huge range, one to five cups per day. Um, milk is recommended to cut back from whole milk down to 1% or low fat. Um, although I'm gonna talk about a study in a little bit, how this can potentially be altered. Um, two to two and a half cups per day. And then you can see the juice number does not go up with age. So after age two years up until five years, it's still no more than half a cup per day. And again, this is not a necessity. Um, this is considered to be a maximum. And again, it should be 100% uh, fruit when, when you're talking about juice at all. Um, what about all the other beverages that, that are out there? And obviously it's not just milk, water, and juice and formula. Um, there's really everything else, and none of these are recommended for children, uh, certainly no children under five, and in general um, should be extremely limited to, to really any children, and even adults if, for that matter. Caffeinated drinks, we all drink caffeinated drinks, many of us do as adults. Um, they, are, they are highly not recommended for any children, certainly no children under five, and um, caffeinated drinks do not just mean coffee and tea, um, most uh, sodas have a lot of caffeine, so you have to be really careful when, when we're talking about caffeinated drinks in general. Low calorie um, sounds very enticing and sounds healthy, um, certainly for adults, um, but you know, in kids, when you're talking about artificial sweeteners in these low calorie drinks, it is not recommended, even if you have a child um, or you're working with a child who's overweight. Um, sugar sweetened drinks, same thing. Um, there's no reason to add sugar to any drink. So any drink that has added sugar uh, is not recommended. Uh, any milk that has flavoring or, or added sugar, so flavored or sweetened milks, um, in, you know, in, there's some consideration that you'll get a child to drink milk if they're resistant to drink milk, but you're adding just so much sugar into their diet by doing this. Toddler milks, which are sort of these also sweetened uh, drinks for toddlers, uh, sort of considered almost like a transition drink are not recommended. And then lastly, we have the plant-based or non-dairy milks. Um, and those are recommended if there is a true dietary restriction or an allergy um, to cow's milk or dairy. Um, and this really should be done under guidance with a doctor or a nutritionist because a lot of these um, milks uh, do not cover all of the nutrition of cow's milk and they have a lot of sugar in them in relation to the amount of protein. So you're losing a lot uh, nutritionally when you're taking these. So you wanna make sure that these are, these are taken carefully. What about water? So this is a water fountain. We're not gonna be seeing these for a very long time. I think all water fountains are gonna be closed for a while. But how important is water uh, in a child's diet? 
So it is important for hydration, but we've talked about, you've probably heard um, the, the notion about eight glasses of water per day um, recommended for adult nutrition. There is no actual sound evidence for that. Um, and the same goes for children. Most food contains water. Um, so they are getting water in their diet from any liquid that they're drinking and, and from most foods, um, even dried foods or solid foods do have a fair amount of water in them. And when it comes to water, I just want to mention that tap, assuming you are in a community where your tap water supply is safe, and this can be checked um, through your local um, water supply company, um, is just as healthy, if not more so, as bottled water. So uh, the supplemented waters and the bottled waters are not necessary and they're potentially harmful for various reasons. Certainly the supplemented waters have a lot of sugar in them, a lot of so-called you know, so vitamins in them or minerals in them, but it's, they're really not necessary for the diet. And um, it is a huge waste of uh, money and plastics uh, and it's damaging to the environment and, and a lot of tap, a lot of bottled waters are actually just tap water um, in with some you know fancy uh, packaging there are billions of gallons of bottled water uh, produced annually and four billion pounds of plastic are dumped annually uh, just in this country it is a 100 billion dollar per year cost in the u.s alone so this is you know especially for families where they're struggling financially um, this is not a way to to spend um, necessary uh, income on uh, nutrition. So just to go back a little bit, um, breast milk versus formula, um, there, there used to be a slogan, breast is best, um, really fed is best. And I think it's important for families to understand that if um, they are not breastfeeding and they are providing formula for their children under age uh, one year, that that's certainly um, just as good. Uh, so on to milk. Um, which uh, is a beverage, but is also considered a solid in some fields because it's it's so uh, nutritionally dense. Um, so it's high protein, high vitamin D, high vitamin A, high calcium, and high magnesium. It also is 87% water. So when we're talking about hydration, it actually, as any liquid, at any beverage is, it's, it's a very, very high water count, content. So it does count as hydration. Um, and it's also a very high ratio of nutritional calories versus empty calories. And, you know, there's sort of the standard notion of quote unquote junk food. Um, but I think, you know, we have to think about junk drinks also. And, you know, regard, it's really not important how many calories there are in a drink. It's really important on what is in those calories uh, nutritionally. Uh, when we talk about eating or drinking, we talk a lot about satiety on how long you will stay satiated or full uh, based on what you're eating or drinking. And so foods and beverages with very high protein and a moderate amount of fat or even low fat um, will last longer hunger wise. And this is very important for active kids. Um, they will feel fuller for a longer period of time. And, you know, we've all been seeing these curves um, in other uh areas of data in our world today. So we're talking about flattened curves and peaked curves. So when you think about satiety, you want to picture it like a flattened curve where it's going to have a very slow rise and a very slow decline as opposed to a very short high peak, which you would see from any sugar uh, beverage and a very uh, fast crash afterwards. So the high sugar, low protein beverages will lead to these very high sharp peaks in energy and then a very fast crash and um, kids will need more to eat. They'll be hungry uh, faster and um, they'll, they'll then end up eating and drinking more um, unhealthy food and drinks. And this is one of the highest risks leading to type two diabetes are these very sharp peaks in falls in energy due to high sugar uh, beverages. So dairy is great. It does not have everything that we need for nutrition. So it, there's uh, little to no iron in dairy foods, and this is milk, cheese, yogurt, et cetera. Um, there's very little fiber, which is very important for the diet, and the vitamins C, E, and K are also not uh, significantly found in dairy products. Um, so these need to be obtained by other sources, such as meats, beans, grains, whole fruit, and then also, of course, whole, veg uh, whole vegetables as well. 
Uh, so sugar in beverages is one of the most significant concerns we have for children in their diet. Um, this excess consumption of sugary beverage is a serious danger to children and to adolescents. Um, it primarily affects minorities and low-income families. A lot of this has to do with um, misrepresentations of labeling and notion that things are quote unquote help, healthy and also inexpensive. Um, so beverages are actually the leading source of added sugar in children's diets, not necessarily sugary foods. And they can consume up to 300 calories per day in added sugars just from sugary drinks. Um, the American Heart Association uh, has stated that added sugars increase cardiovascular disease, not just in children, but if children are consuming these, it's going to impact them later in life. Um, the American Heart, Heart Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics um, have stated that sugary beverages increase heart disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, chronic illnesses, and they have a strong recommendation to minimize uh, these beverages in children. Um, obesity in children, and when we talk about obesity in children, it's a little bit different from adults. Um, in adults, we talk about the BMI being over a certain number, so 20, 30, 40, uh, the, the basal metabolic index. Um, but uh, in children, we talk about it as uh, percentile. So when, when a child is greater than 95th percentile in um, height over versus weight, um, they are considered obese. So there are over 13 million children ages 2 to 19 who are obese, or 18%, um, over 25% of Hispanic children, and over 22% of African American children um, under age 19 are considered obese. And close to 14% of children ages two to five are obese as well. So this is getting, uh, these numbers are getting higher and higher and are getting younger and younger. And obesity is not an entity unto itself. It is associated and causing many other problems in the short term and the long term. These include sleep disorders, type two diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension. Uh, so sleep disorders are linked to obesity in children. Uh, up to 10% of children have some degree of sleep disorders, and it is often associated with obesity. And then this becomes a vicious cycle of poor sleep, uh, then followed by hunger. There are hunger hormones that are higher in children with sleep disorders. These trigger sugar cravings, carbohydrate cra cravings, lower energy, those high energy peaks that we talked about, um, minimal exercise and fatigue. And then again, that leads back to poor sleep and obesity as well. Um, sleep apnea itself is associated with poor school performance, exercise intolerance, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes. So you can see that these are all linked together. It's not that one thing is an entity unto itself. So obesity in children, uh, part of it is genetics, um, but <clears throat> part of it starts um, just by habits uh, very, very early on. So over 40% of adults are obese in this country, and this has increased in 1999, so just over 20 years ago, it was 30%. And then severe obesity has more than doubled um, from 4% to 9% over the last 20 years. Um, obesity in adults, same sort of concerns, although more so associated with heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, chronic lung disease, uh, sleep apnea, and strokes. So where does obesity originate from? It's not just from eating junk food. It is a lot to do with food insecurity and access and poor access to quality health foods. Um, the cost of healthier foods is much higher and cost of fresh foods is much higher. Um, there is limited access to education and understanding uh, good quality foods. And again, it's, you know, we have this, 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 notion of junk food, but people don't really understand about junk drinks. Um, they have limited access to exercise. We know that people who are staying at home, living in tight quarters, cannot go outside and play as easily, um, and limited access to health care. And this is only going to become more of an issue um, in the coming years for sure. Um, so what are some of the health benefits of dairy? So there have been some good studies. I'm just going to briefly go over this one very large study called the PURE study, which was the Prospective Urban Rural Epidemiology Study. Uh, it was published in The Lancet in 2018, so quite recently. It looked at 140,000 subjects, and these were adults in 21 countries over five continents. Uh, these were adults ages 35 to 70, and they followed them over a nine-year period. Um, they looked at their dietary habits related to dairy, specifically milk, cheese, yogurt, and butter, 
And they also looked at fat content. So they broke this down just really um, into in binary into whole fat or low fat. Um, they didn't really distinguish between 1% or skim uh, when they talk about milk, but just whole or low fat. And then they also accounted for other health issues such as family history, age, smoking, gender, physical activity, and whether they lived in an urban versus a rural environment. Um, and then they looked at uh, over those nine years, um, what sort of cardiovascular events they had, stroke, heart attack, heart failure, and death, and then also looking at non-cardiac related deaths. Uh, what they found, interestingly, that most protective was greater than two servings of dairy per day versus zero servings. And they found that, whole, interestingly, whole fat milk um, led to the lowest risks of death, even over non-fat milk. Um, there was a small but notable benefit from yogurt and cheese. And sorry to say that butter uh, didn't make anybody healthier. Um, so how do we change habits? Um, obviously, it starts with education. I think many people don't know the negative health implications of products labeled as healthy. So when you see the word juice, you think of healthy, but when it's a juice drink, it's not necessarily healthy at all. When you see a milk product, you think it's going to be healthy, but it's a flavored milk with a lot of added sugar. Same goes for supplemented waters and, of course, energy drinks, which we see uh, commonly in adolescents, although those are being used in younger and younger kids as well. Um, so I like to talk about flipping the label. So the front of the package, when you're looking at something, and I think this is really an important part of education, uh, starting early and even for parents, is the front of the packaging is all marketing. Uh, the nutritional label is the informative part, and it is quite deceptive to consumers. Um, it doesn't matter how educated they are, because educated consumers are, are deceived as well. Um, but most of the terms on the front part of the label are meaningless. So all natural contains real fruit, could mean that there's five or 10% fruit, could same thing which goes for juice, contains real juice, could mean that there's 5% juice. Good source of could mean that there's 10% of a certain nutrient. Excellent source of can mean that there's 20%. So these are very low numbers. No added sugar is probably one of the best ones because then you think that you're not getting any sugar. And we'll, talk, we'll show you an example of that. And wholesome is a nice word, but it really doesn't have any nutritional meaning. So I like to say to flip the label. So we know these are very healthy looking drinks, especially the green one. Um, it's 100% juice. There's no sugar added to any of these. Um, and it's boosted and has all these nice pictures of fruits and it's very enticing. Um, it's small, so it looks like it's gonna be just a little healthy boost. But when you flip the label, um, this is just, you know, there are a fair amount of calories, 270 calories in this tiny little drink. And there is no fiber. And as we all know, fruits and vegetables, um, one of the main benefits of them is the fiber itself. And there are 53 grams of sugar in this tiny little juice drink, even though it, on the front it says no sugar added. So it's really quite deceptive um, how people are reading the, uh, the front labels. Um, so the education needs to start in schools, uh, school meal programs. I think it's really important for children to understand what they're eating and why. Uh, adults need to be educated because obviously they are the first line uh, for our children, especially when we're talking about parents. And I think that marketing um, companies need to be transparent when they are trying to sell their product, but also adding a little bit of deception as far as um, the actual health and uh, nutritional benefits for a lot of these drinks. So what can we do about this? Um, beverage consumption, I say it begins as a newborn. It really begins uh, before that because I think it's really important for pregnant moms to also consider their diet uh, very carefully and make sure that when they are eating something that they are getting as much bang for their buck nutritionally and that even if they're having more calories, and again, I really don't want people to focus on calories, um, that they are going to be focusing on eating healthy foods as much as they possibly can and drinking healthy drinks. Um, I think it's, again, the, the goal should be high nutritional value, not necessarily um, low calories and um, more fo focus on the content of the food and to understand how to read a label. I think it's really basic um, as early as a child can read and look at numbers, they need to understand um, what these products contain. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. 
Thank you. And I'll turn it over to our next speaker, Lisa Mack. Lisa is the executive director of the National CA CSP Sponsors Association, responsible for working with the board of directors to develop and implement the long-term operating plan to ensure the growth and success of the organization. Central to that plan is managing member relationships, resource and product development, training and conference programming, and partnership development. Lisa previously served as a director of corporate communications for a food service software cor corporation, where she was responsible for client communications and newsletters, user group conferences, and partnerships with industry organizations such as Second Harvest, Research Chefs Association, Women's Food Service Forum, and the Society for the Advancement of Food Service Research. Lisa is a graduate of Pace University with a BBA. Lisa, take it away. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, it's been great to hear from Dr. Shapiro. A lot of what she shared with us just now definitely aligns with what's going on in the child and adult care food program environment and what that means for nutrition education in the zero to five child care environment. Thank you for inviting me here today to speak and share about the resources that we use to empower families and child care providers with the knowledge that to make healthier eating decisions and create healthy eating habits in children. Okay, so this is just a quick image um, of some of the nutrition education resources that we have on our website. Most of these are available to everybody um, for free of charge at www.cacsp.org. We have hundreds of resources, and I'll go through a number of those and what nutrition education looks like in the CACFP environment. But first, I wanted to share that I had been asked to share how we get our resources into the hands of those who will use them. And we're talking about an entire community of over 200,000 child care providers, whether they're in homes or in centers, in after school programs, and um, over four and a half um, million children who are served snacks and meals daily. So, so our standard channels in terms of distribution for our nutrition education include an e-news that we send out weekly to over about 78,000 people. We have a social media following of about 8,000 daily followers with specific posts that can spike up to 100,000. And we have, a, of course, our website where we have about 5,000 people who regularly follow, again, um, spikes following an e-news or a social media push. And then, of course, we have partnerships with organizations like the Dairy Council of California, who invited us today to develop resources that are pertinent to specific groups within our community. So first, I just wanted to say, as an overview, what is the Child and Adult Care Food Program? I'd like to ask for a show of hands of how many people who know the program, but we're all working from home today and I can't see your hands. So I thought I would do a quick overview about this federal USDA program where child care providers and home centers and after school sites agree to be willing to follow a USDA defined meal pattern while menu planning in order to receive financial reimbursement. We know that serving healthy foods costs more money. Um, but in addition to serving meals and snacks and he making healthy choices in what they're serving the most vulnerable uh, population, uh, we also serve the adult care group as well. There's about 115,000 adults out there that are being served in the CACFP, but they have access to education materials, tools, resources, and technical assistance from sponsoring organizations and those state agencies who review their month menus monthly and then visit them three times a year. Our role at the National CACFP Sponsors Association has been to provide training and nutrition education for the entire community. So we sort support anybody whose goal it is to make sure that the people that are being served by the CACFP reimbursement program are having access to those tools and resources. What we find is there's plenty of parents, families, and other child care providers who may not participate in the program also taking advantage of these nutrition education materials, which is the end, end goal for all of us to make sure that children are growing up, developing lifelong habits, and becoming adults with healthy eating habits. The, the first thing you should know about 
um, the meal pattern, which is part of this child and adult care food, food program, is that it is the building block upon which all other nutrition education is developed from our organization. And CACFP operators must follow this USDA meal pattern in order to receive fin the financial reimbursement that we talked about. What we try to do is develop attractive, simple, technical assistance that will serve as reference materials and provide nutrition education. We like to call this our refrigerator reference card. Um, it's de designed as a postcard size um, po postcard that anybody in the program can set on their refrigerator to remind themselves that for all meals in the CACFP, a milk, vegetable, fruit, meat or meat alternate or grain must be served in order for that organization to receive that financial reimbursement. This particular reference card we developed in cooperation with Sesame Street, as you can tell, um, because what we find is that kids who see Sesame Street characters tend to try foods that are more um, healthy in nature. And so we've been working hard with them in terms of a partnership to develop materials that they can be that can be used in the zero to five environment, not only to serve healthy foods, but also to educate the kids in the child care arena what they should be looking for. This particular piece was distributed to about 100,000 providers across the country. We have nutrition education training and we have all kinds of them. I'll go through this piece a, a, a little bit fast. You can find most of these on our website and also on the um, handout that you received. We have everything from creditable calculators. And what that means is that in the CACFP, again, in order to be reimbursed by the government, you have to follow certain guidelines. Not only do you have to serve those five meal pattern components we just talked about, but if you're serving yogurt, the yogurt has to be within a certain um, sugar limit. And so we put together a, a, a brochure that helps them to, to determine with those nutrition fact labels that are, as Dr. Shapiro said, often on the back side of the packaging, what to look for and sort of what to look for if, and make it sort of easy for them. So rather than having to do the math calculations, they can simply look for a certain banded group and determine whether or not that's creditable. Sugar in the CACFP, any cereal that is served also has a sugar limit. And this, and this piece is another one of our creditable calculators that help providers to determine whether or not the cereal they're serving is considered healthy enough to be reimbursed. We had a whole, we have an identifying whole grain rich creditable calculator. Um, whole grain, again, to the marketing piece um, that Dr. Shapiro referenced, definitely can take on a whole, um, whole area of its own. If it's 100% whole wheat, and it's a bread, then you're, you're pretty certain that that's going to be a whole wheat, 100% whole wheat bread. But there's a lot of tricky marketing out there. So we have an eight page um, guide here that also went out to about 100,000 people to help people determine what really is whole grain rich and what really is going to be beneficial to the children. In our program and in the CACFP, if you're serving grains, at least one of those grains must be whole grain rich. This um, sort of two-pager, um, we know that six, eight-page uh, document in terms of identifying whole grain rich can be sort of overwhelming. So we put together a two-page sort of um, front, back, and, and, and in Spanish flow chart that sort of helps people identify those rather quickly if they're at the grocery store. This is a great example of one of the nutrition education pieces that we put together. Um, this was developed in partnership with the Dairy Council of California. This particular flyer addressed milk, what the milk requirements are in the CACFP. They follow the guidelines that Dr. Shapiro set out earlier, of course, um, in terms of what age, what type of milk is appropriate for which ages. Um, and this was distributed, um, while we worked on the content together, this was distributed by the Dairy Council of California in hard copy to all of the California child care providers. And thanks to them and their funding, Serving meals, as I mentioned, serving milk at meals is a requirement, as I mentioned, in the CACFP. This particular resource, therefore, has been seen and used and shared by tens of thousands of people across the nation. Um, and this is a great piece of nutrition education that's available on our website. In our e-news, anytime we feature this particular piece, it's downloaded by thousands and thousands of people. Um, and as far as milk being required, one of the things that Dr. Shapiro also talked about was 
is the fact that there are beverages in the market that are labeled milk, almond, but they're really a beverage. And so in this particular case, we define what milk is and that that's cow's milk in terms of the nutrition for children. We have everyday nutrition education flyers available on our website, and that's everything from some outside of the box thinking to how to read a nutrition label, their CN labeled food, which is child nutrition label, and how, do, how does a provider read that to determine a mixed food and whether it contributes to a grain or a fruit or a vegetable in terms of what it's served. And then we have some web everyday education pieces that talk about um, our best practices, best practices in terms of what, what you should serve. One of the things that Dr. Shapiro also noted is the size of the juices that are allowed. In the CACFP, you are only allowed to serve fruit um, one time, and that's to count for a fruit. So even if you're serving a breakfast, lunch, and snack, or a supper, regardless of what you're looking for to be to submit for reimbursement, it needs to be um, only one time for the, for the fruit. And we definitely ask that people consider serving vegetable um, twice at a lunch or a meal instead of a fruit if possible. We have tips and other helpful tools like family style dining, some stages of infant development feeding, healthy cooking tools. These are um, pieces that we have available again on our website um, to help with nutrition education. There's so much available and we know that there's a glut of it. Um, so some of the teaching materials that we have, we try to break it down and make them attractive and fun so that people aren't afraid to use them. And so some of those things that you might be able to find include this provider toolkit, which talks about just adding water and making water fun. And how do you, and water is beyond um, hydration. Like let's make it part of our regular diet, but also let's um, talk about the water cycle and some of the other um, things we can do during the week to make water fun for kids. This is my um, largest, you'll see this again and again in most of our, most of our materials. If I was to share anything with anybody about how to get nutrition education into the home and into a child's life longer term than just in a child care provider environment is to make sure that they that you are sharing um, sort of activity pages on the flip side. So here we have our I ate my ABCs because vitamins help me grow, and then we send home a um, fun chart for them to sort of check off what they're doing at the home as well as what they've learned in the child care um, environment. And then here are just some fun things where we find that if there's a craft or a table activity, um, a physical activity that can be tied to a sort, a sort of the learning process, that we find that people really adapt to and take advantage of those as much as they can. Other planning activities with guides that we have are simple um, documents. Again, showing here that if we have a cow mass craft, that tends to go home with the, with the children and, and then the parents tend to read the sort of flyers that we're sending home as well a little bit more. So we have also um, planning activities with guides. These happen to be about the New Year's. Um, you'll see it again with the Chinese New Year. Anything where it's front and back, that'd be my tip to everybody in terms of how to get your nutrition education message back to the homes and the families. We also have recipes and menu planning. Um, we find that um, these need to be meal pattern compliant as we talked about. And people love to have a cycle menu that they can use. Obviously, any of those of you that have done CACFP or cycle menu planning, that really can't be done at the moment with the shortages that we're finding in the supermarkets. So we're really looking at what is the right thing to be serving to the children these days. And we have a whole other series of nutrition education around that at the moment. So while these were great um, prior to COVID, these are not necessarily the resources that people are looking for today. But what they are looking for are the same type of easy to implement recipes um, that have nutritious snacks. Kids can also participate. We have a series on how to care for children while social distancing. So where we might have said in this particular recipe previously, have a pair of children work together to make this fun snack. We now are sharing um, tools and tips with people on how to do nutrition education in an environment where we're keeping the social distance um, at top of mind. Um, again, some more work with our partner Sesame Street, making fruit salsa, super fun, and then uh, adding this Halloween Zoodle monster snack with some olives and um, zucchini that is spiral cut. We have the Child Nutrition Today magazine. That's once again, this is a document that our board funded 
Um, and through the distribution process of sponsors across the country, we were able to get out both of these to about 100,000 providers across the country. Um, we've done one each of the last couple of years. And so we have one coming up and it features everything from materials that we've already previously discussed to um, infant breastfeeding uh, versus infant formula. And then we also have on-demand webinar training on our website. We have a partnership with the USDA. They put together a number of webinar series that we have hosted on our website. And when people take that particular webinar, uh, just like the webinar you're taking today, you get a certificate of attendance for some CEUs. Um, and then we've also have some that are developed from our organization as well under CACFP University. This is the type of nutrition education that people are taking advantage of right now. We have a lot of people across the country that are at home that can take 30 minutes to learn how to serve healthy foods a little bit quicker than they might have if they were um, in the office. And then finally, we do a lot of nutrition education at our annual conference. Um, that has really grown um, since 2013. It's unfortunate, of course, that we had to cancel it for 2020. Um, we have a lot of great speakers and folks that are lined up for that, for that, but we were able to convert some of those onto our website. So we have a lot of people taking advantage of the nutrition education. And when I say um, people, it's not just the sponsors that are administrating the program or the state agencies or the child care centers um, or the providers, but we see a lot of families taking advantage of this particular, these particular resources, which is really encouraging. Additional resources, of course, come from the USDA. There is a food buying guide for child nutrition programs. You can go on that online today if you'd like to. That gives a lot of detail about what is creditable and what is not creditable in the, in the food program. But even more importantly, there's some just great nutrition education available from the USDA on their website. And finally, um, just real quick, thank you for having me here to share what some of our nutrition education goals and strategies are in terms of how we get the information out to people, as well as what we have available for folks to see. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, so we have some time for some questions and answers. Um, and we have a few, a couple of comments and questions for each of our speakers today. So the first, um, I will send it to Dr. Shapiro. Um, would you be able to clarify the AAP recommendations for starting solids at four to six months. Um, the comment is that this is for the introduction of highly allergic uh, foods and for those infants that are uh, developmentally ready. Um, so would you be able to expand on that? Sure, so the question was about four months, starting solids at four months versus six months. And um, again, initially, actually for many years until recently, it was it was standard for six months. And that was really across the board, um, whether there was concern for environment for food allergies um, or for developmental progress. And then um, they cut it to earlier, uh, not necessarily uh, for potentially allergenic foods. Primarily, we're talking usually it's peanuts um, and peanut protein. Um, it was really just for developmental uh, ability of the child. So it's not, they're not recommending that ch children start at four months, but they are saying that a child can, you can introduce solids uh, to a child as early as four months if they are developmentally ready. Um, as far as the allergenic foods, and again, you know, this was, uh, you know, made a lot, you know, there was a lot of research looking at when to introduce uh, peanuts. So years ago, meaning um, about, you know, a decade ago, it used to be that you should introduce peanut butter or any nut butter at age two years. And then it was reduced to one year. And these are again, just the nut butters themselves to spread thinly on, on a piece of bread or a cracker. And then um, they were finding that the earlier you introduce uh, peanut uh, powder into a child's diet, the less likely they can, will go on to develop allergies. And again, this even was uh, recommended for women during pregnancy. Uh, for a while, they were saying no peanut, peanut products uh, for a pregnant woman. And then they went the complete opposite way and said, yes, you should eat peanut products if you're not allergic, and that will lower your infant's ch chance of being allergic. So now they are recommending that when you are introducing solids at four months or six months that you can introduce, um, they make this, you know, it's really literally a 
powder that you can put in infant cereal uh, to introduce uh, potentially allergenic food. So they're not recommending four months, but they're saying that you can start as early as four months. Thank you. Uh, next question for you, Dr. Shapiro, is on um, just to clarify the statement of breast milk versus infant formula. Um, mm -hmm. And if that is just as good, um, specifically around the nutrients it provides versus the immunological benefits. Right. So I think that, you know, the, the, the old phrase used to be breast is best. And frankly, it is still. Uh, for, a, for a newborn for various reasons. One is that actually nursing itself does uh, promote uh, increased oral tone and can reduce for various reasons the risk of SIDS. And, um, and it, so there is some actual physical benefit to breastfeeding even you know, better than taking pumped breast milk. And yes, immunologically, it is certainly beneficial because you are gonna receive some of the immunoglobulins uh, from uh, the mother, especially if the mother has received recent immunizations, uh, specifically a flu shot and a, a, DTA, a Tdap, which is uh, tetanus, diphtheria, uh, and pertussis immunization during pregnancy, which is recommended. So the infant will benefit from that. Um, you know, however, it, you know, there, there's been a lot of evidence that, uh, you know, the negative connotations of, of infant formula have, have caused, you know, a lot of postpartum depression or increased uh, risk of postpartum depression in moms, guilt feelings, um, feelings that they're not providing for their children. So now it's recommended that we can say that fed is best and to take a little bit of pressure off the women that cannot breastfeed for various reasons. So yes, nutritionally, physically, and developmentally, breastfeeding is better, and actual breastfeeding is better than pumped breast milk. But, um, you know, again, there have been a lot of problems with women feeling very, you know, negative about themselves if they're not able to breastfeed. So they've, they've turned that a little bit. Thank you for the clarification. Sure. Uh, yeah, and so the next question is for Lisa. In the education materials that you've developed, what is the specific role of reduced fat in skim milk or yogurt for children above the age of two? Um, I want to make sure I understand the question. So I, I sort of answer it the way I heard it, um, that in terms of the child and adult care food program, milk itself is its own component. So when many people think dairy, but milk is what must be served at meals in order for that to be considered creditable. And the, C the um, USDA meal pattern indicates that low fat and or skim milk should be served once a child is chewing over. Is that your question? Yes. Thank you. Uh, one more question for you. Uh, was attention was there attention to limited literacy or readability skills used to develop your educational materials? And if yes, how so? That is such a great question. I, I think that the flat out honest answer is probably not as much as we should have. Um, there's, we have a number of resources that are simply um, given by pictures, but we, the majority of them, as you probably saw in our particular slideshow today, are really driven towards the child care providers themselves. So we distribute through the sponsors or in our e-news. Um, and most of those um, child care providers or after school programs are the ones that then take that, that information and sort of relay it. And so in terms of what does it look like once it gets home and in, in readability, I'm gonna I'm gonna share that we, we probably did not pay as much attention to that as we could have. So I don't have an answer for how to do that necessarily at this point, but I'm definitely going to put it on my list of things to consider. Thank you. Thank you. And then one more question for you, Lisa. Um, will the CACFP materials be revised to include the new nutrition facts label? So we have only a couple of them that we actually address nutrition labels and we'll absolutely revise them when they come up. Most of our guidelines, most of the documents that you saw today don't actually address the nutrition education label, but once, if and when there's, when, the new, when there's a new one, if that's not the one that we have currently, we'll absolutely make sure that's updated, yes. 
Okay, and then second part to that, Snap Ed cannot use material that has brands displayed, such as YoPlay or Nabisco. Must these be displayed? Yeah, that's a great question. So the one that we did for YoPlay, we have since re re replaced. This is an older slide for us, and that's currently just a red banner with a with a um, with no no branding. We recognize that that's important to people. So we've revised a number of our materials to not have branding. With regard to the whole grain rich piece, we were unable to do some of that as much because it was needed in order for people to identify when they're in the supermarket what they're looking for. But what we have done for state agencies who have that same need, and they use, um, we have slideshows that go, that sort of support some of these materials as well in one hour training. Um, there's a whole one on identifying whole grain rich. And in those particular cases, we've sort of blurred them out. Um, and I, I hope that that would be helpful for you. Um, and if there's anything that's on our website that you'd like to use, but you can't because it looks like it's branded there, it's not our intention to have them branded. Um, it was simply what we picked up. A lot of the work that we do, including that um, whole grain rich one, so the USDA dropped their, providing, their guidance two weeks before our conference. So we had 1,800 people coming to the conference and we had brand new guidance about well, how to define whole grain rich. So it was sort of midnight to 6 a.m. work at Walmart <laughs> for, a number of, for a number of nights in order to develop that. And so we're definitely um, happy to accommodate any need that you have to, to be able to distribute these in a way that works for you. Okay, thank you both. It looks like that's the questions that we have for today. Um, so I just wanna thank everyone again for participating on today's webinar on nutrition education and prioritizing children's nutritional needs in the zero to five childcare environment.